intro. So welcome everyone. Thank you for logging on uh, this afternoon. My name is Matt Schumann. I am a, a programming librarian here at Cary Library. Before we begin, just a few things to note. Please let me know in the chat if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them uh, via the Q&A button. Um, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. And I'd like to now introduce Ashley Rooney, a former president of the Lexington Field and Garden Club, and she's even been called the plant lady. Um, Ashley has been the host of our gardening series for the past two years and has brought many gardening experts to the library for our curiosities. So now please welcome Ashley. Thank you, Matt. We're going on our third year here. Um, and today I have Jim Harshberger. And I have to tell you, he was recommended to me a couple of years ago but I didn't know him and I hadn't worked with him. And so I suggested that he come down and he said, well, give me some pruning to do. So I'm kind of responsible for the, uh, the grounds at Church of Our Redeemer here in Lexington and they needed work. So he came and he transformed the bushes over there. The hinoki that was growing, going back, reverting to its natural roots, he changed that, he fixed it. He wired it together. The viburnum, which had taken over this whole area, he cleaned up so it's much more beautiful. Jim can make wonders out of your trees, and you can learn a lot from him. And if you haven't seen his first lecture, I'd go back and see that one after this. Um, the library has it under YouTube's. Oh, I'll so, include the link in the uh, recap email I send out afterwards. Oh, great. Um, so now let me introduce Jim speaking from California today. Take it away, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, I'm in Santa Barbara. I, I do anything that I can to escape New England for the winter, returning when the leaves come back out on the uh, deciduous trees. Uh, it certainly is beautiful here today, but <clears throat> uh, as Ashley had said, this is the second presentation that I have done the first one was general pruning, uh, and I started even with uh, sharpening your uh, pruning shears, uh, making sure that they were clean, uh, sterilized. And those kind of things aren't going to be covered today, but certainly if you have any questions, please interrupt me. <clears throat> the, uh, the billing for today is uh, that I'm going to go through and talk about removing damaged, uh, dead structurally or unsound uh, uh, wood in your uh, plant materials. All of those holistically can be covered under the term of pruning. So uh, if, if you'll allow me the, uh, the, the opportunity, I'm going to talk to you about pruning and in so doing, we can take care of uh, any kind of uh, branch structures that, uh, that may come up and I will take you through the process. One last thing to remark here that I was thinking about this presentation. A long time ago, I took a, a certification to be a scuba diver, and they had told me, we will present to you the same material seven different ways and seven, seven different times, and in the process of our going over and over and over again, it's going to sink in and it will become something that you own. <clears throat> I'm going to be doing the same thing with you today. You don't have to go scuba diving but I'm going to keep repeating things until the point where you look at something and say, oh yeah, this is what Jim said, and that's how you get started. So uh, Matt, yeah. for that, we could go to the first slide. And let me interrupt here. Yes. Uh, Jim will take questions in between, just put them in chat and <clears throat> I will field them. All right, okay. so, thank you. Uh, the, the, the plant material that I photographed, and I, I uh, just say this as a caveat, are plant material that are normally under care. So I'm not going to be showing you any uh, Dr. Seuss trees that, uh, that, that have been discovered after 50 years and transforming them. What you're seeing here are places that I would have normally worked on an annual or semi-annual basis. So uh, I know the plant material, I've worked with it before and it's not out of bounds or in, in any way uh, dramatically uh, misshaped. The, the kinds of things I want to explain here to you in the area of doing the pruning is that as you look at as a, a, a plant material, in this case, this is a boxwood going from a rear yard to a, an upper rear yard. The first thing that you think about is what do I want to create from, from this plant material and what does it want to look like at the end? 
And then how am I going to go about doing it? In, in the first instance, and I will repeat this time and time again, the, the best thing that singularly can happen is as you go over the plant reviewing it for structural damage, uh, baseballs, footballs, dogs, what have you, you want to do thinning. And uh, I'll, I'll explain thinning to you in detail. Thinning uh, opens up the plants. It creates a much more interesting looking effect across the plant. It exposes the interior of the plant to light and air. And in the, that you're doing it, you're actually making it a healthier plant. By removing the most aggressive growth, you're allowing the secondary and, and tertiary growth to fill in and uh, the, the plant becomes a, a better part of your landscape. In the case of this boxwood, I started by going into the plant and pick any place. And there's probably, I would say 30 or so cuttings that, that I had done on this. And those cuttings are in excess of two feet long. And uh, the next slide will give you an idea of the size of the cuttings that I'm taking out. So you can see a man's arm there. That's, that cutting would be on the order of three or four years worth of growth. And by doing that, then you open up the plant structure. You certainly have reduced the circumference of the plant. You've taken care of those long branches, they're gone, but you're also opening up the plant to new growth and it's actually healthier for the plant. The last thing that you're doing here that you, you aren't necessarily gonna catch quickly, this is not being done with uh, head shears or anything like that. These are, these are my Felco pruners. When I'm making the cuts, the depth of the cut that's made is done in such a fashion that you don't see the cut. So it still is looking just as natural and just as fresh with no leaves at the top split in half because of a, a head shear that's gone by. And it will look absolutely clean, none of the cuts showing. So there's now about, let's say 30 or so cuts that come across this. The next thing that you'll do is you'll go back and look at it afterwards and I, I tell people pruning is, is like pickup sticks. Everybody knows how to prune. Everybody knows how to play pickup sticks, but you do it one stick at a time. And in this case, you go and looking at the plant, you're attempting to create uh, a, a pruning structure such that it's a little bit from everywhere without creating large holes or in any way damaging the plant. So on the next slide, you'll see here, um, I just marked up the random areas that need to co cover completely across the plant. And in each of these areas, you go inside the plant and reach into there and make those cuttings of three and four years worth of growth. And then afterwards, you can look at the perimeter and say, have I done it all? And then make minor adjustments that the, the thinning part of the uh, actual uh, activity is the primary thing that you want to accomplish for every plant. All right, that's what I wanted to say, get started. So on the next slide, uh, this, uh, this process, uh, uh, there's one other thing here to show you. In addition to the thinning, there's a, a secret for all Japanese maples. In the case of these that are on uh, Lowell Road in uh, Concord, the plants are about seven feet tall. Uh, they have been pruned by me for the last four or so years. And from the outside, as they, uh, they, they continue with their aggressive growth, the, the parts of the plant actually start looking more like gumdrops. There's a green gumdrop and a red gumdrop because the, the, the silhouette is only the, the thickness of the leaves and you really can't see the structure of the plant. It's almost impossible to take something on like this if you were doing it from the outside. But if you were to go onto the inside of the plant, you will see a completely different structure. Matt? On the inside, here is uh, the, the complete uh, anatomy of the plant, all of its bones, its, its branches, its trunks, its dead wood. And I would uh, tell you that when you're doing pruning on any kind of a decent sized Japanese maple, the pruning that you will do and you will do best is always by going inside the plant. So. Here goes Jim back into the plant. Don't poke your head. Uh, and I'm looking for deadwood, uh, which will typically be a silver colored and stubby and not any leaves on it. And then anything that's crossing over uh, or rubbing, 
Uh, and then the ultimate goal here in doing this kind of pruning is you want to end up with something that is about one and a half courses of leaves on the perimeter, and then you will have accomplished the, the, the pruning that's necessary. <clears throat> Again, recall the previous slide, how thick it was and how you couldn't see the structure. If, so if, if, if you were to take on the plant from the outside, you never could tell where you're going uh, and you wouldn't know when you got there anyway. But from the inside, at, back to the, the, there, on the inside, you can see everything and it will be done so much more quickly and it will be so much more efficient. Uh, one other thing to point out when you're inside there, you can also tell what's actually gone on with the plant if, if it has been damaged. And the point to make here is that these plants, especially in New England, where we have problems with snow load on our, on our favorite uh, plant materials, the Japanese maples with these horizontal branches, as you can see at the, the center going from uh, right to left, as that branch becomes more and more loaded with caked on and hardened and frozen snow, the branches are susceptible to physically snapping off. And, and Japanese maples don't bend in the winter. They, they snap and they break and it'll, it'll, it'll absolutely crush your heart seeing these poor plants destroyed. So please, one of the things that have to be done is you thin the plants. And in this case, this was done in uh, August or September. You thin it so that the snow can fall through the plant and that the plant structure is uh, stable and will be there for you for uh, following years. Now on the next slide, you can see something that demonstrates this. Uh, this was a, a Japanese maple I pruned for the first time, similar size, but uh, this was in West Concord. And the gentleman uh, with whom I was working asked me simply to do it. And when I went inside the plant, first step, go inside the plant to do all of your pruning. What did I see? The circled uh, item at the top is uh, a two or three inch branch, which you know could represent 15 years worth of growth that had been completely snapped out. I will guarantee you it was done by snow load. And because the plant was so thick that it caught all of the snow. And then of course we had rain and sleet and uh, the plant can't maintain it. So it snapped out and the bottom circle was uh, similar except the branch was slightly different. So it just ripped it apart and the two uh, upper left going branch and the lower right uh, split and uh, could have uh, completely destroyed the plant. Mm. Uh, both of these could have been avoided if anyone had been doing uh, or knowing to do the, uh, the pruning that's uh, prerequisite for Japanese maples. All right, on the next slide, another example of the same thing. Uh, Again, uh, this is another split leaf Japanese maple. This one's small, this one's on about four or five feet, uh, another home in Concord. And it completely had dominated the, the beds of the uh, uh, boxwood to the left and there's uh, Andromeda on the other side, had to get it fixed and back under control. What again is the first thing that you have to do? The first thing you have to do after you've looked at it and either understand from the client's uh, perspective or that you formed it on your own, what do you want it to look like when you're finished? And then you go inside the plant. You can't get anything done on the outside except the perimeters. Japanese maples do have a habit of putting off wisps and little branches that go up like antenna. Those are simply removed to get it back to its normal shape. But by going inside the plant, you can see the complete structure you can see all of the branches, you can do the dead wood, you can do the thinning, everything that's required from the inside. So on the next slide, you'll see the, the completed uh, Japanese maple. Now here you can see the, the branches reaching out, you can see the trunks of the trees, you can see the, the boxwoods to the left, and you've created a natural uh, separation between the two and everything in the garden is happy. But it all starts by going inside, the Japanese maple or inside any kind of a shrub or tree that you're going to work with, always go to the inside and start out with the thinning. So Jim, a question. Yes, um, you actually get down on the ground then and get underneath that tree to when you say get inside. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The, the, uh, the, in this case, it's still, you'll see uh, one coming up here shortly, Ashley, that um, uh, doesn't allow that, you know, depending on the size of the Japanese maple, you've got the, the miniatures that might be a couple of feet tall on all the way up to a standing tree. 
in the ones I've shown you so far, yes, you're on your hands and knees. Like I said, watch it, watch out for your heads. If you had a choice, wear protective glasses so you don't poke yourself in the right. eyes. But the, anyone doing commercial work will go inside the plant to properly prune these. You cannot touch the plant from the outside and get anything done. Okay, good point. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. uh, on the next example, uh, this one is that small one, and it it it, it was uh, me crawling behind the plant and uh, against the fence. Uh, luckily, the plant was growing towards the, the camera here, towards the south, and it was uh, a little bit easier to work with. But still, I was on my hands and knees in the back, attempting to to reach inside. Again, with that veil of the the dark green, or, or in this case, dark purple, you can't see the structure of the plant, so you can't prune it. If you can't see it, there's there's a trick that's actually done when you're pruning. If you lift up any of the branches, you can see the underlying branch structure. In this case, we're going inside it, and you're under the leaf, and uh, the the structure just becomes available. Um, uh, look at the next slide, and this is you can see afterwards. So here we've we've thinned it out, but by going back to the fence and then peeking in, I can see everything and. Uh, that now the rock is showing, it's, it's bounded, it's ready for uh, fall. The, the snow is going to fall through the plant without damaging or potentially even loading up all of those horizontal branches. Again, it just it, looking at this tree, you can see if, if anything were to happen farther out, it's just like uh, snow ending up in a flat tennis racket. It just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates. And in time, those branches will snap out. They do not bend and they uh, rarely do recover after they've ha had that damage. Mm. Uh, the next one, we actually have uh, our star, Ashley. This was at her Episcopal church. And these, this, these are, there's two um, upright Japanese maples in the parking lot. And while I was there, I said, what do we do something with these? So I said, well, let's, let's do some photography. So you can see it's still uh, early on in the season. We've got Ashley all dressed up in her winter coat. And the, the, uh, the, the little sketches that I did on the, uh, the shape of the tree, nothing had been done to these trees since they were planted. So that the base where it circled was filled with uh, water sprouts and the, uh, the tree had never been thinned. It had no shape at all. They looked like large lumps, uh, only dividing one side of the parking lot from the next. So yes. we put this on Ashley and Christopher and I. And the first thing I, I talked about here, just like I've said before, you have to get inside the plant in order to see the structure of the plant. There's an additional thing to mention here for trees. And the, the additional thing is to create the proper branch structure. They're called scaffold branches. And it's exactly the same as why we would uh, consider taking uh, children with uh, misshapen teeth from birth or however they came in originally and getting braces on them. The idea of braces and, and doing structural pruning on trees is exactly the same thing. You want to prepare, in this case, the Japanese maple for its future life, which could be another 50 or so years, by removing branches that don't make any sense and by keeping the, the scaffold branches that will actually be radiating out from the center of the trunk, just like uh, spokes on a bicycle from the axle all the way out to the wheel. And then after you create the branches that you want and that you don't want, you go through and you do the thinning, just like we spoke of before. And again, I'm inside, I'm against that trunk, my head's up in the branches. It's the only way you can see inside. And I'm taking out those branches and I'm, I'm going through with the X's and opening up parts of the tree to let in light and air. And then the last thing is create a pleasant shape. In this case, something that might be pyramidal or an oval shape that would be um, something that, that would feel nice. And then the last thing is remember if you're doing more than one, they all have to look the same. It, it, it looks a little funny if they don't look the same. So you'll see in the next slide, uh, Christopher has, uh, is working on the, uh, the next tree down. The base has been cleaned out. You can see where the white tape is. All of the suckers have been removed. So you've got an exposed trunk. Now it looks like a tree rather than a shrub. We've done the thinning with the different X's and Christopher is working on the perimeter to give it that, that pleasant shape. Um, then, yes, ma'am. 
Explain the white tape. Uh, the, the, the white tape that's there was likely put there to, uh, to keep um, overzealous string trimmers away from the trunks of trees. Uh -huh. we, do, we do more by accident to kill trees than we, we ever do on purpose. And uh, the, the kind of things that, that I look for at the base of the tree, and one of the simplest things you can do is simply mulch around it. Because if there's mulch around it, the lawnmowers aren't going to go after it. Yeah, that uh, makes the sense. Lawnmowers and string trimmers can do more damage to a tree than, than the, all the insects and diseases we have. And mm -hmm. it's keep the human interface the, the, the less intelligent human interface away from the tree. So in Good this point. case, the tape is, is there to protect the trunk. Yeah. It looks so much uh, better there. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll, they'll have all this, this spring too when they come back, but now they'll have a, a pleasant shape. So um, that uh, we'll go on to the, the uh, next slide. And here's the, uh, the tree now. It's completely opened up. We still have to go through and take care of some errant branches here and there to give it that same shape, comparing the two trees back and forth, but we're pretty much finished. And I, I would say that the activity there was on the order of 30 to 45 minutes per tree. And they're completely different and they'll be that way for the next five years. You can go back in five years, but we've, we've saved the branches that we wanted. We've opened it up. We've given it a, a pleasant shape. And uh, if you can see there is there at the base a little bit of area. I talked to Christopher about that. Get the grass away from the base of the tree so the string trimmers don't go after it. And uh, that's uh, a very, very wise thing to do in all cases for all trees. Next slide, please. Here is um, a, a woman by the name of Kim who Ashley had uh, uh, referred me to. And uh, Kim had purchased a property on uh, uh, East, uh, East Lexington and the back of the, uh, the, the property was a very, very prominent uh, Coosa dogwood uh, that had been let go. This was a new house that they had purchased. And the, uh, the, the goal here was to uh, really feature the plant and it was uh, terribly overgrown. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the kind of things that I would uh, normally have said is that it needs to be uh, crown thinned and then you need to go through and get rid of the deadwood, the crossing branches, any places where branches were on top of them, each other, we only need one branch per space. And then by going through this and removing all of these branches through the process called thinning, and it, again, it's done from the inside, you don't address the outside, always the inside first, just like the Japanese maples that we've talked about and the boxwoods, everything from the inside out, by doing this, I will have removed um, probably about a third of the, the total branch structure of, of the plant. Uh, by the way, the, the ladder that you see, there's a 10 foot ladder. So that, that's the size of the plant I was working on. And uh, after that period of time, I removed all of the suckers, the branches that were growing inward, anything that didn't make sense. And if, if any of you have any questions about what doesn't make sense, please ask. I'll be glad to go through it. But if you look at the next slide, <clears throat> this is the, the result in uh, about two and a half hours worth of work. After all of the interior wood has been removed, the branches that didn't make any sense, the things were in the wrong place, going the wrong place, growing inward, uh, I would then address the perimeter of the plants, again, looking for branches that were out of shape or things that didn't make any sense, and uh, the plant's done. And of course it had a wonderful spring and the, the woman has since uh, invited me to come back to the property and work on her ornamental cherry tree. So that, that was a compliment to me. Uh, on the next slide, uh, another example, this was done in the fall. This was a property in Bedford where this, uh, this plant material called winterberry, which is a, a native holly that typically has uh, red berries. Uh, this client just wanted the plant uh, pruned properly to match the rest of the landscape. And where you see the X's, that was the obvious example where they didn't like these branches poking up. And the, uh, the first thing that, uh, that, that Ashley is asking is, Jim, do you get on your hands and knees? So <laughs> here goes Jim. There's three of them. Jim is on his hands and knees underneath this holly. And the first thing that you see is where these branches up top are emanating from. These are water sprouts. 
they are not part of the branching structure of the tree and you prune them back to the trunk of the tree where they've come out of, as I have done in the past. So then those are removed. You do all of the thinning from the inside. You clean up the trunk of the tree where there's more water sprouts coming up. And as uh, I crawl around on my hands and knees doing all of this, the plant starts making uh, sense. And then after all of that, you go back to the outside and say, now, how does it look from the outside and address each one of the plants? On the next slide, though, you'll see where the, the base is now cleaned up. You can see through the plant. The perimeter is, is a, a natural shape. Uh, the branch structure is exposed. All of these things come from the, the thinning process. And uh, again, uh, Jim being on his hands and knees crawling around. And I will tell you that if you aren't doing it from the inside out, you're not getting the full effect that you want. And once you do try this, you'll see what a difference, just like the picture I showed you back before with the, the, uh, the weeping Japanese maple, the green one. When you see the branches from the inside, everything makes sense and you can see every cut that you need to make. From the outside, you don't have a chance. Okay. Can I uh, take a break and let me ask you some questions there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Connie wants to know what is the green growth on the branch and is it bad for the plant? No, I don't know which branch. This I think it was back at the Japanese maple. Okay. It, was it was probably at, some. Um, I think it was this. Uh, one Mike? more. There. Uh, this, this, this is simply a, um, a growth that sets on the surface that has nothing to do with the health or welfare of the plants. Honey, yeah, I, I gave you from, I elevated you to be able to talk, so you should be able to unmute. Yeah, so I, I'm curious because I have a lot of what looks like that green stuff that's on that um, Japanese maple. I have it on my dogwood. Right. And I didn't know if it was, um, It's it's been there for several seasons and I wasn't sure if I was doing something wrong or needed to medicate the tree somehow or. No. the. The, the material is a, a combination of, of, of fungus and algae. It, uh, it, as they say, it just indicates you've got clean, fresh air. Uh, it's topical and it represents no harm to the plant material whatsoever. You'll see it across uh, every, every potential growing uh, medium. Yeah. Okay. We have a great tree. Um, we have a Japanese maple, which always partially blocks the walk way in the spring. How to prune it back and when? The, everything that I've done here on the Japanese maples, I have done after a, a condition I call hardening off. Hardening off means that the plant has put out the bulk of its growth for the year. Nominally, that's uh, July, August, September kind of time frame. And the, uh, the, the condition that you're referring to needs to be addressed more dramatically than just a, an annual pruning. You need to go back in and look at doing some structural pruning which is what I had talked about there for the upright Japanese maples. You need to alter the shape of the tree by, by making more aggressive cuts, potentially removing branches. The other thing that can be done is if the branches are in your way, uh, the, the, uh, the bonsai techniques of, of bending branches by putting in wire, uh, you can take those branches that are in your walkway and you can actually form uh, different shaped trees by fastening wire to parts of the branches and pulling them interior or upright or whatever you want to. Again, the same thing as uh, using uh, uh, kids' teeth and braces. You, those, those wires they put on there are meant to form the teeth and the directions you want them to go. But uh, to, to your initial question, uh, the work that uh, needs to be done is done in the uh, summer to later summer and uh, should be done more aggressively than uh, you would normally do if you were doing an annual pruning. Thank you. I have a very leggy azalea that has branches reaching about seven feet high, but really not a lot of volume and dimension at the base. How far down should I prune and at what time of the year should it be done? Uh, the, the, uh, the pruning would be done again after the plant hardens off. You could also do it now while they're asleep. The, the kind of pruning you want to do there without devastating the plant, uh, we talked about in the previous pruning classes, and it's uh, called restorative. 
you would take out a, a full one third of the plant back hard, leaving the other two thirds. The next year you take out another third and the third year you take out the remaining third. If done in such a manner, you'll still keep your azalea, but you will completely restore the plant to a much, much smaller plant. And as each one of those prunings is allowed to recover, that new material will grow in and give you a, a new uh, azalea. What can you do if a lawnmower did make a cut in the tree? <laughs> Fire <laughs> your lawn guy. <laughs> they, 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 honestly, the, the, there's a cute story and I'll tell you about this really quickly. A man putting in a deck for me is looking at me and he's putting down a nail in this beautiful piece of fur flooring and he misses the nail and puts a big whack into this beautiful wood. And he looks at me and says, you know, you can't see that from my yard. That's what happens with lawn people. It's not their property, it's yours. And the first responsibility you have is to your plant material and who you allow to work on it. And when you abdicate that, you're gonna end up with something different than what you wanted. Uh, the, the nicks and things like that, that, that can occur to trees, there's nothing that you can do other than to keep the plant healthy and vigorous and that the plant's natural resources are its best ways of healing. What I would do is I would get something like um, a light fertilization like Hollytone and dig that in across the roots and do it annually to give the plant as much uh, energy as possible so that it can grow back and heal those, uh, those damages. Great. I'm going to leave the next three questions for a while since it's uh, 25 of and let uh, Jim finish a little more of the lecture. And okay, then what, what, one other thing here, uh, Matt, stay right there. That, that the area to the right, uh, that, that green, um, um, gosh, all right, never mind. We'll go back to the presentation. Okay. All right, so this, this, um, this was the Hollywood done. Now we're on, these are U hedges that are done every year. Uh, <clears throat> you've got, you can see all the, the longer uh, branches that have grown out uh, annually. Again, this is as, as I had said before about pruning, this is as the, this is the full growth of the plant for the year. So now you could go, because it's steady state, you can prune out the branches. And the first thing that I would tell you to do here, you've got some dead wood on the right, which was where the barbecue grill had heated up and burnt the plant. And then the, the rest of it is uh, just normal uh, growth. The first thing to do, you got to thin the plant. I've talked about it before. I'm saying it again. And uh, the, the next slide you'll see here, uh, this is the size of the cuts. That's uh, probably a 20 inch branch. I'm reaching inside the plant. I'm making cuts that you will not see. So you don't see any of those round little circles where the, the plant's been cut. And the, the process in doing that is you do these cuts, uh, you open the plant up to air and moisture, uh, the, the plant becomes a fuller plant as you remove these more aggressive stalks out. And as I said before, I think I said 30 cuts that I had made on the boxwoods. These are random, but there, there might be every three or four inches separating each one of these going down inside the plant, removing these. And as you do this, the longer branches start disappearing and the perimeter that you were concerned about in, in reducing to the size of the rest of the shrubs is uh, gradually disappearing. The last thing here is when you step back, you look at it and say, okay, now what do I need to do? And you'll, you'll find there's very little to do once you've taken out these aggressive branches. On the, uh, the next slide here, you can see it now it's done. <clears throat> the areas where the X's are, they're a little bit darker. Those are where the, the cuts were made inside the plant and they give it a much more pleasant and 3D effect just by doing what I was describing. And uh, this kind of pruning is called informal. This is not the pruning that you would do with shears where everything ends up to look like a ball. This is all hand done one branch by one branch. And it's, uh, I consider it much more artistic and uh, uh, a, a much more beautiful hedge. That's that one. And the next example is, <clears throat> this is a Japanese holly, the same thing. Overgrown, it was crowding the stone wall. The, uh, the vision looking from the left to the right was completely blocked. 
and the client wanted me to reduce the size of it. When, when they reduce the size, the first thing I think of is thinning it. It needs to be thin. So what do I start doing? I start going inside the plant from both sides. Uh, there's a ladder there. You can see the, the ladder to the far left uh, uh, bottom side. That was a six foot ladder. So I'm working with a six foot ladder, reaching down into the plant and on the sides. And I'm taking out branches that were as long as three feet to give the plant more air and more light. <clears throat> and uh, by removing these large, thicker branches, you're encouraging the smaller, more desirable branches to come in in its place. On the next uh, slide, you can see the result. So you've got a branch uh, structure now that's much more visible. The plant is obviously more thin. Uh, again, uh, with, with snow load, uh, all plants are subjected to this. By opening it up, you don't have the same risks of damage to your shrubs because of uh, the snow and the, the winter weather that we have in New England. And you so don't end up with those little round bushes. No, no we don't do round bushes. I'm, yes, unfortunately, <laughs> a lot of people do do round bushes. There, there's a, uh, an organization called Plant Amnesty that encourages people not to do those kinds of things. Yes. So it's a uh, not-for-profit corporation that, that attempts to teach people the same thing. It's, we don't use gas shears. We don't prune in little round bushes. <laughs> yeah. All right, the next slide. Uh, this is uh, Andromeda or uh, Pieris that was overgrown. And uh, again, it's, it's lost pretty much all of its, uh, its shape just because of the density. The, the point I want to make here, guess what? The first thing Jim does, Jim gets on his hands and knees and goes to the, <laughs> the plant. And uh, you can see inside on the next slide. I'm taking out a branch here that's three years old. And by doing this, I open up the branches to the left and to the right. And now there's more light and they will then in turn grow in. Uh, and as they do, the, the actual size of the plant is reduced and the plant's a much happier plant. So. You can see where I'm marking there, I'm doing a cut back in there. I think the next slide has the physical uh, branch removed. So that's, that's easily, that's the first cut is in the middle of the page, the second's above that, and then the third. So that's three years worth of growth. Don't just take off the growth that's, that's sticking out. You aren't doing any favors at all for the plant. It's gonna get denser and denser and it will only grow on the perimeter. None of the interior will have any leaves because all of the light will disappear. This is I think Jim, Jim, you also told me when we were doing this is to look for when I was inside the tree or whatever, to look for the branches that were diagonally going cr crisscrossing each other. It's hard to decide sometimes right. which branch has to go. But you said the diagonal ones, the ones that cut across was another rule of thumb that you would <clears> use. Uh, the, the crossing branches tend to abrade to rub against each other. And yeah. generally, if you, if you follow them to their extremities, you'll find one is the dominant and one of them is, is a nuisance and take off the nuisance. And where, where that vacancy exists, new plant life will, will come to establish itself. Uh, again, it's, it's the same thing before that I was talking about where I mentioned that you wanna, you wanna create a, a long-term structure of the plant by, by removing and allowing the best branches to uh, continue. So crossing branches are one of those conditions that are always removed. All right, on the next slide, there, I'm, I'm making that cut again. And, and you see, Jim is on his hands and knees. <laughs> All right, enough said about that. Yep. On the next slide. Uh, this is a property in uh, Winchester, which had a number of these uh, Styrax trees put along the right side of the driveway. I think there were six of them. And they come in from the nursery. This is an important thing for you to know. When nurseries su supply material, they want them healthy and they want nice green color and they want you to see that it's, it's a vigorous growth. They didn't say anything about uh, whether or not it was pruned for life. It's not. And this is another one of those examples where structural pruning done properly will create the structure that this plant material is gonna wanna have for the next 50 years. None of these were structurally pruned. Each one was its own individual shape and the, uh, the client simply asked what could be done. So I've started doing it. The first thing is they all wanna be the same size. They all wanna have the same pattern. 
And uh, like I said, structural pruning is first. On the next slide, you can see, I, I gave you an idea here. You should visualize something you wanna do. Here's a, you know, sort of an isosceles triangle. And by making them in, into a, a pyramidal uh, shape, it's a, a comfortable shape that you can start with. It won't necessarily take on that shape the first year because not all of the, uh, the trees are gonna have the same branching structure. But by visualizing the shape of it, you've got at the base underneath the, the green triangle, a certain amount of height of the trunk. That looks common when you get it done. Then you start bringing in the sides and then you take care of the top. Of course, we always want to go through and do the thinning, taking out the branches that don't make any sense. And then this year, when I go back to visit it, it, it will uh, again be pruned tighter and tighter and they will come uh, into a perfect uh, shape. Uh, last thing to say here, this is done after the plants have hardened off and after they've had their flowers, they have a beautiful white flower. So uh, happy, uh, happy trees. The next example, this is a, a different kind of thing, but just to give you another idea, this is a, a golden juniper that's grown as a standard or upright as opposed to a, something that wants to be a, a small or creeping shrub. And uh, the, the client here wanted more of a bonsai effect, which I call cloud. The idea here is that all of the golden branches you see want to be uh, pruned such that all of the interior growth is taken off the plant and only the pad or like something the size of a, a pickleball or a, a tennis racket face is left. Wow. And uh, if you look at the base of the plant to the right, you can see a solid sh a shadow. That's the density of the plant as it is when I, when I got there. This was in uh, New Hampshire. But uh, you can look on the next slide, you can see that just from the shape of the, um, the shadows, each one of those branches now are pruned out to where you see small semi-circular kind of things that I call pads, uh, which has taken me over two hours to individually remove every two inch branch, leaving the trunk of the tree vacant, all of the branches extending out to the edges, all of have been pruned and removed and uh, the plant is now nice and airy and will stay that way for several years. But that's an example of cloud pruning, which is uh, not your ordinary kind of thing, but it's something fun to do. The next page or next slide is, the, the, this is the remnants. That's an eight by 10 tarp. That's the amount of plant material that I had to remove to get this thing to the state that it was at. Mm. All right, uh, I think the next one is another Styrax. So here's another uh, tip for you. This is a, uh, another Styrax, a Japanese snow bell at the front of the house. And they simply wanted to maintain its shape the way that it had been. I pruned it every two years. And there's a secret here that it's, uh, it's trivial, but if, if you know that you had pruned this before, there's gonna be a scar where the, the previous cuts were made and that you know this no matter what the tree is, where it had been pruned before, that branch and its location is never going to move. It's gonna be exactly the same place unless something mechanically has happened to it. So by going into the interior, and these are probably two foot or so, three foot branches, go to the interior of that branch and you'll see where it was cut two years before and remove that uh, piece of uh, new wood. On the next slide, you can see the, uh, the stub there that was uh, circled and a cut that I'm going to make, removing that uh, branch going off to the right by going across the plant and looking for each one of those cuts, I can restore the plant, uh, not, not immediately because I'm probably making 500 cuts across the plant with my Felcos, but I will completely recreate the plant back to its original shape, starting at the base and working up. On the next slide, you'll see the uh, progress. So I'm two thirds of the way through, that's about 14 feet. And I've gone and removed each one of those branches. Now I'm taking it back to the shape that it's been on the next slide, you see that I've, I've taken it out. Now here, once I've taken the perimeter out, then I go through and I look for thinning opportunities, uh, any dead wood that I've missed, any of the suckers, anything that looks uh, uh, out of place and the, uh, the tree is finished. But again, everything's done from the inside. After I've taken care of the perimeter, everything's on the inside. The next slide. Uh, one last thing here to show you, everybody says hydrangeas. 
this was a spring cut, uh, a spring view of a, a client in Lexington. Uh, I didn't even go there for that, but I said, may I please take care of this hydrangea? It looks terrible. Uh, what you see there are a combination of dead branches and branches that haven't leafed out yet in the spring. And I wanted to make sure that this seems to be an annual question for everyone. What do I do with my hydrangeas? These are the ones with the big purple flowers. The idea here is you want to take all of the areas where you don't have growth in the spring and cut them back. Now, cutting them back, uh, I want to say something about it. You, you can cut it back and functionally you will have done it, but you won't necessarily have done it aesthetically. And I want to point out the aesthetics of it. Cutting it back, you look at the next slide. When I cut it back, those cuts are going to the interior of the plant where the leaves that are existing on the plant are shading the cuts, so you can't see them. I call those hiding a cut. Uh, and when it's done, the plant will look like everything's been you know, happy and healthy with it, except all of that, that dead wood, those 20 branches are all gone. So on the next slide, you'll see there's a, a couple growth spurts on the left and the right, but otherwise all of those dead canes are gone and every one of those cuts are hidden by the existing leaves and uh, the plant looks yeah. wonderful. And plus the fact is once it gets going, it's gonna be three times its size. But from right now on, the, the whole landscape has been cleaned up and all of those silver uh, dead looking canes are removed and the process takes 10 minutes. Very, very easy, but just make the cuts so that those those dead canes are not poking out through the green. They're all back inside it and things will look much nicer. All right, one more. This is, uh, this is a different story. Uh, this is a, a house in uh, Marblehead and the, uh, the gardener wanted me to come and do the, the annual pruning. I hadn't worked here before, but I knew the owner. And I said that I didn't want to do the pruning. And I, I said, I would talk to the owner, but that, that I, I was uncomfortable doing the work. And the uncomfort that I felt was these two Japanese hollies bordering the, uh, the brick walkway into the house. You look at the picture, you can see that several windows of the house have already disappeared. And it didn't make any sense to me. One of them was a living room and it's dark enough in New England without covering it up with trees, especially uh, evergreens. There's um, the hollies on either corner of the house. Those are Meserve and the ones there in the, uh, the front are the Japanese hollies. And then there's boxwood hedges and little uh, rhododendrons. And when I met with the client, I said, I can see what you want me to do. And he'd been using head shears and it, you know, it looked perfectly round, Ashley, just like we don't like. Uh, <laughs> and I said, I'd like to propose something completely different. And he said, what? So <laughs> look at the next slide. <laughs> I said, let's remove them. Wow. And uh, he, at least he had known me. So it, he had a little bit of trust with me, but I said, you're, you're obscuring your house. You're not doing your, your house uh, any favors. You're keeping everything green, but the, the plants are, are taking over everything. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, look at the difference. Hmm. Look at that. Yeah. That's lovely. So we, we took out the two. Hollies, that was uh, several trips to the dump hauling trash. I, I thinned out the perimeter hollies on either corner. I, I fixed up the boxwoods and uh, had a very, very happy person. But sometimes you just stop and think about what you're doing. Is, it, is that plant necessary? Has it outgrown its application? And in this case, I argue that it had. And uh, it, the, the house just popped. It was a, a great looking house and it didn't need all of that shrubbery in the front of it. So just because you get into the habit of doing pruning doesn't mean you shouldn't think about the, the, the bigger picture. In this case, uh, the client was very, very happy with the results. <laughs> Next slide, please. That's it. So oh, you have questions. <laughs> any questions uh, at all? Yes, you do. What would you suggest after pruning to get Holly bushes taller and less wide, and at what time of year? Ooh, it depends uh, on the holly bush. It, there's different kinds of, of hollies. 
So with that, uh, the, the common Meserve holly, the ones that have the red berries that we commonly uh, use, they'll, they'll start with uh, a different life uh, plan for each plant, independent of what you want them to do. But you need to go back to the center of the plant and start pruning from the interior to reshape it. Pruning on the outside isn't going to do anything except to make the plant more sticky or more small branches poking out, but that you need to completely reform the plant by going into it. And, and it, it, that you want to make it taller, you want to uh, keep the branches from being pruned up top and allow that. That's called apical growth. And it's normally the way they will grow. And then you want to deter the growth by pruning inside the plant on the, uh, the, the sides, and you can reshape it that way. Okay, and how do, do I prune a limelight hydrangea to allow it to grow large but not leggy? Uh, the, any of, any of the, um, the, the hydrangeas are always done in an annual basis. Uh, I, I can't think of one that you wouldn't, uh, even an uh, oak leaf hydrangea. The, the limelights will, uh, will want to get bigger, and it, the, the best thing you can do, and I do this uh, on those kind of things at the end of the season, you need to just aggressively go back and, and prune them harder than you would have normally. Uh, the limelights are very, very comfortable with hard pruning. <clears throat> and if, if you aren't aggressive, they will get leggier. So you need to go, uh, you know, October or so, wait until the leaves fall off and, and then you can see all of the, the branches, but you need to be much more aggressive in your pruning. Yeah. I have several mountain laurels that have become too big. How much can I prune them back to a small size? Isn't that the one third, one third, one third? It's, it's one third, one third, one third, but uh, most mountain laurels are very, very, very slow growing. So uh, pruning mountain laurels sometimes is, is a, uh, a losing battle. Uh, I would suggest that you, you try to do some restorative pruning by pruning back one third at a time and be very, very aggressive with it, but that mountain laurels grow much, much more slowly than other plant materials. And it, uh, it may not be as satisfactory as you want it to be. Maybe the best thing to try to do is uh, uh, take them out and uh, replant something else that will also tolerate uh, lower shade uh, conditions such as um, Andromeda. And I think you might be happier with that than with the mountain laurels. Can you replant the mountain laurels if they're not too old then? I mean, can yeah, I you, can you can replant them. They're, they're just, they, they tend to pick up fungus more readily than most plants. And uh, in general, mountain laurels disappoint more people than, than I would think. And I just don't, uh, I don't like working with mountain laurels. Yeah, you see them more in Connecticut than you, where they're happy than up here. It's a little, maybe too a little cold. Um, I'm going to skip one question because we have two on rhododendrons. When should hydrangeas be pruned? Uh, there's different kinds of hydrangeas. The easiest pruning to do is done in the, the fall uh, for the, the ones with the big purple flowers that are called macrophylla. Those are the ones that people get into debates on. You can prune them by looking for uh, the canopy if you wanna wait until the leaves fall off, uh, that's fine, and take out about one third of the canes. Uh, if you wanna be thorough about it, you can wait until the spring and see what responds after you've pruned in the fall. And as I showed in the picture, anything that's left in there that doesn't seem to grow out or is slow to grow out, you can prune all of those back then and your spring will be fine. I would also uh, suggest at that time you do your fertilization before the leaves come out. You can get some nice uh, 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 organic fertilizer dug into the soil. Oh, we're really getting our money's worth, Jim. Um, I would remind you all, there is an earlier tape that he has, uh, that the library has, and Matt's going to put it on the thing. Do, do watch that, especially those of you wanting the one-third, one-third. Any specific tips for pruning rhododendrons? I bought a house that has a dense area of somewhat overgrown rhododendrons, and another person asked, any special advice for rhododendrons? Uh, what was the, third, uh, the second question? Any special advice? Um, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, the, the first thing I tell you that nobody ever thinks about is when they want to prune down to the windowsill, everybody prunes to the windowsill. And as soon as the plant puts out growth, it passes the windowsill. Uh, so you want to prune thinking that the plant is going to grow 
and anticipate that by removing six inches more of the plant material. The next thing is uh, rhododendrons will grow quite a bit and that uh, if you do the, uh, the kind of pruning that, that you wanna do, you're gonna make the plant look um, uh, unappreciative. It'll, it'll look beat up and thin and a lot of things. And the restorative pruning of taking out hard cuts, one third, one third, one third, is a better way to proceed. Uh, otherwise, it's going to look awfully naked and you'll say, why in the hell did I do this? And uh, most people would say, yeah, why did you? So I, I would uh, try the restorative pruning and uh, take back the plant uh, slowly and then you'll, it will fill back into a, uh, a more uh, appreciative and uh, landscape smart size. And I would point out there are areas here in Lexington that have famous old rhododendrons that go way back when there was a castle up in Merriam Hill. Um, moving on, what would be a good shrub as a hedge that is native and needs less maintenance? Thanks for the great presentation. She was thinking inkberry. Uh, and inkberry is, uh, is a native, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Hey. The, the thing about ink berries is that they, they tend to splay out. Uh, they, they tend to be a long, narrow, uh, small branches and snow load will tend to squish them. Uh, they take a little uh, bit more special pruning. Uh, the, uh, the Japanese holly, although it's not a native, is, is a stronger branch and uh, is more durable and in an urban environment than the, uh, the ink berries. Uh, the, uh, there was a, a, an example I gave you in there of another holly that uh, is uh, a native as well, and those would do well. Um, after that, uh, I think boxwoods are interesting, but boxwoods are uh, prone to a lot of insects and diseases. I wouldn't suggest that at all. I would second holly and usually suggest it to people because it is pretty at all times during the year and the birds love it. Yes. Um, when you get a chance, Jim, I need tips on pruning thorny quince, a 10 foot <laughs> bush. Do I remove the new shoots via root system or just cut them to the ground? Um, quince is, is kind of a, a martial art. It's a hand to hand combat. They are vicious. <laughs> And uh, that there's no simple, fun way that, that normally I, I just defer and say, I think this is, this is best for you to prune. It, no, it, sure. uh, and that also is a good example for gas powered shears. There's anything you want to do with a quince. Uh, they, they, they tend to take any kind of pruning and the further you stay away from the thorns, the happier you're going to be. Okay. Uh, she also wants to know what to do with wisteria, which is also around 12 feet tall. Uh, the, the weight is going to 25 feet. Wisteria will destroy anything unless it's rebar, something that's made out of iron. Uh, you can prune your wisteria as hard as you want. Uh, generally, when I prune it, people are always aghast. You pruned it too much and it comes back just as quickly the following year. Uh, you can wait, uh, wait until the plant is hardened off and prune it back, but just be conscious that wisteria can destroy anything. And if it's climbing, it's going to take over. It's one of one of the slides I had last year, and the house had been taken over by wisteria. Yeah, could really. Get, we're not in France here. I hear that roses should be cut way back, but what if I want the rose bush to be bigger? What? The the here's the thing. Uh, all plants are not equal. Certain plants are, are grown to be 12 feet tall. Uh, there's azaleas that are 12 feet tall. There's azaleas that are two feet tall. Make sure you have the right plant before you impose your opinions on what its um, uh, genealogy is. If you want the plant to be a larger plant, what you want to do is you want to keep the plant uh, uh, properly shaped and supported. Uh, especially if you want it to be larger, you, you have problems with uh, the, the winter uh, um, uh, conditions. And the, the reason I say that is you don't want to prune the plant back as hard as you would normally do for the winter. So you have to figure out some way of supporting the branches. Otherwise, the, the snow can damage the branches and will defeat your purposes. So in general, I would say you would want to shape the plant properly in the fall uh, with the conditions knowing that you wanted to grow it larger, maybe even look at uh, structure to support it. 
Okay, um, we're at one o'clock, so I'm only going to answer one more question here. I have to take somebody. I don't think I've was asked a question before. Is it okay to force a tall plant to remain shorter by both thinning, as you have indicated, and also topping the plant every three years or so? Sure, sure. It, uh, it's, it's 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 first of all, it's your plant, so you can do anything with it you want to. Uh, <laughs> The judicious pruning, especially at the right time, as I said, when the plants hardened off in the in the summer, give it a try. Uh, I, I would reduce it, go inside the larger cuts. You could use a pair of, of loppers. You want to cut it down to the union of, of, of the branches rather than stubbing it. But uh, yes, you can you can do that. The, the critical part is that when you re, when you reduce plants, you've got to leave enough green tissue, enough leaf area for the plant to generate its photosynthesis. If you take off too much of that, the plant will go into decline, which is the first part of dying. So you've got to leave enough green material on any tree or shrub for the plant to continue to do its, its body functions. Um, actually, one other thing. On the following slide, uh, I've got my phone number and email if people oh, want to ask questions. Put, let's put that up. Okay, so for those of you, there are two questions that I haven't uh, responded to. Um, here's his phone number. And I think obviously given the popularity of his lectures, we will have to have him back again. Um, we all need help in pruning. Um, and I thank you all for coming. And Jim, it's fantastic to have you here. You can see with the amount of people and the amount of questions how needed your advice is and how helpful it can be to people. I really appreciate that. Do take down his phone number. And Matt, can you put that on the handout? Yep, I will include that. Okay. Um, so, and there are various series of thanks here. Um, it was a great presentation. Right. And that thank was, you, Ashley. Okay, well, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you both. And thank you everyone for coming.